Uh, my name again is Scott Deutsch. I'm the brand and communications manager for America Makes, and I'll be your host this afternoon for this webinar, this TRX webinar. Um, we are set to start at one o'clock, and we'll get underway here right away. But before we um, before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone can see the TRX webinar series slide screen that's up on the that uh, should be on their WebEx screen at the moment, and. Um, I want to take a few moments as we begin and as people still start queuing, I see people still coming on board, um, give you a little bit of background on the TRX webinar series before we introduce our speakers. America Makes created this platform called America Makes Technology Review and Exchange Series so that we could convene the additive manufacturing community on a monthly basis. By doing this, we are also supporting the mission of America Makes to expand and accelerate the footprint and adoption of additive manufacturing in the U.S. A few important notes before we kick off today. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for brief questions and answers. If during the presentation you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A space on your WebEx screen and we will ask it during the Q&A session. We'll do our best to get to all the questions asked and we will uh, like I said, we'll put them off at the end. Today's, today's um, presentation is going to be a little bit different than some that you may have attended in the past where we have, today we actually have a panel. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you Christy Carlson. And she's going to take it from there and introduce her panelists and give you a little bit of background on this uh, added manufacturing materials characterization today and the future presentation and discussion. So uh, we look forward to, uh, to what we're about to learn here now. I'll leave it to you, Christy, if you're there. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Christy Carson, and I'm the Digital Marketing Com and Communications Specialist here at QES. As we thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and thank you to America Makes for having us, and uh, thank you to our panelists. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you our panelists, which, um, Dr. V. Sundar, Dr. Michael Chapman, and Mr. Bill Davis. So Dr. Sundar brings a combination of materials knowledge and product development experience as our manager of technical marketing here at UES. He'll be giving a great, inter or a great overview of the RoboMet system as well as an example of an application. The next up we'll have Dr. Chapman who also brings an impressive materials knowledge to the table along with expertise in a wide variety of materials and applications in automation and in scanning electron microscopes. Mr. Davis is a consultant with us who managed GE's metallography and electromicroscopy lab for 37 years. We'll first start with uh, Dr. Sundar with our overview, then head to a case study of um, additive manufacturing with Dr. Chapman, then another case study in ceramic matrix composites with Bill Davis, and then we'll have a discussion in Q&A with any of those questions that you typed into the Q&A or the chat, and we'll talk about those later. Without further ado, here is uh, Dr. Sundar. Thank you. Christy, thank you. Scott, thank you, and thank you to the audience for being here today. Uh, it's our pleasure to, to discuss this topic about serial sectioning and how it can be applied to generally materials problems, but as well in specifically to additive manufacturing problems. So let me begin by going through and just addressing what the need for serial sectioning is. Um, serial sectioning is a very old technique. It comes to us from the paleontology and geology subjects where we're looking at multiple sections of materials. And the reason we look at materials in 3D is that a lot of the processes that we're interested in studying for these materials do happen in three dimensions. We're very used in metallography to looking at a two-dimensional model of a material and drawing conclusions from it. And so this cartoon that you see on your screen here illustrates a three-dimensional feature and how, if you look at just a two-dimensional aspect of it, you could draw different conclusions about that same feature, whether it's about its size or shape or other morphological features. So something like serial sectioning will actually enable visualization of these 3D materials features in their entirety. And the way we go about it, as you see the video playing on your screen, is by imaging multiple slices or sections of the material in 2D and thanks to the power of computing that we have at our fingertips today, 
we can reassemble these and reconstruct them in 3D to sort of like fingerprint the material and reassemble a digital model of the material that we can then interrogate to draw conclusions from. So that is sort of at least an overview of what we're trying to do with serial sectioning and sets up a little bit for our next slide, which tells you about RoboMet 3D, which is an automated, a fully automated serial sectioning system. So we're very happy to share that, you know, UES is a small company just here in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, we work very closely with the Air Force Research Laboratory, and this is one of the technologies that came from the AFRL, uh, successfully being transitioned back to the AF, and we have about 30-odd installations of these. We'll talk about these a little bit later. But basically, it's designed to be a robust platform for visualizing complex materials and microstructures in 3D. Um, it's been well known that you can actually metallographically polish through most solid materials and look at them to assemble these 2D slices. What's held us back as material scientists so far from engaging fully with this technique, in my opinion, is that it is uh, fairly painful in terms of manual labor to go through this manually, and again, limited in its repeatability in terms of uh, the manual processes are always can be very exact on good days, but less than repeatable on some other days in terms of how much material we can consistently remove in each section. So an automated system like this would offer you enhanced productivity, uh, significant increase in sectioning rates, but also faster data collection and faster decision making. Uh, we also offer this as a service in, in addition to like offering this equipment itself, and we'll talk a bit, little bit about that further down the road too. So for the people that are interested in how the system works, we thought we'd go a little bit into detail about just describing what it does. Uh, I think about the RoboMet sort of in like two distinct sections. On the right-hand side, you have what uh, sort of a portable metallography lab, if you will, and on the left-hand side of the system, a automated microscopy station. So once I put the sample into the system, there's a polishing robot that grabs it, takes it over to the polishing wheel on the right side, and that polishing wheel is populated with polishing solutions that are on board the system. You can load up to six different polishing systems, uh, solutions of your own choice. Uh, we typically use a combination of diamonds, silica, alumina paste, things that would be familiar with most people that do metallography. There are also eight platens and an automatic platen exchanger in the system. And what that does is that the user can then program a metallographic workflow or recipe, and this robotic system will come in and put in the right platens at the right time, express the right amount of polishing solution at the right time, and the polishing table is then programmed to rotate at the right speed or RPM uh, in order for the polishing to take place using that polishing robot. So we can, you know, go through a pad where, let's say, you do a six micron polishing step, pad is exchanged, you do the next three micron polishing step, one micron, et cetera, one to each pad so that it minimizes the risk of cross-contamination. Once that polishing, grinding and polishing is done, we can then optionally etch the system using acids. We can neutralize it. We have dipping wells in order to clean the system uh, with ultrasonic automated wash and dry. So at the end of that process, you have a surface that is metallographically appropriate for you to optically image using that system. And that's when it goes over to the microscopy half where there's an optical imaging station, an automated stage, and as a user, I can program exactly what I want imaged on that particular surface that I've prepared metallographically. Once it's done, I can repeat this process multiple times to collect multiple sections through the system and assemble that 3D model that we talked about. So where does this technique fit in? Because you know there are multiple techniques that enable us to interrogate materials in 3D, starting on a sort of uh, large length scale. If you look at this graph, we have volume analyzed on the y-axis in approximate voxel dimensions that you can res resolve on the x-axis. Right up there at the top end, you have ultrasonics, which can uh, not destructively evaluate multiple large samples in some cases, but the resolution may be limited to about a millimeter or so. Right? And on the bottom end of the graph, you have ultra-fine resolution techniques like local electron or atom probes or electron tomography. WorldMet 3D uh, sits at somewhat of like a sweet spot here in comparison with the X-ray tomography too. Uh, we use mechanical serial sectioning as we call it here, and you can interrogate voxel dimensions of the order of microns or even some submicrons, depending on what you're looking at. But more importantly, it's a unique combination of optical microscopy resolution with a metallographic scale of investigation, millimeters to cubic centimeters, so that 
you can truly look at microstructure look um, in detail without being limited by the density of the material you're evaluating. So to summarize sort of basically how the system works, uh, it, defines, it depends, of course, on user input. I need to understand something about the process of metallography in order to like analyze my material well. So I can program that into my computer. The system then automatically executes on its grinding and polishing sequences to prepare a surface. And then we can clean and optionally etch that surface to introduce metallographic contrast. And once that's done, we go to an imaging step, including multiple tiles or mosaic areas, montage areas of that surface, where we can assemble a large optical footprint image. We then bring those images into post-processing, where we can assemble a 3D model and draw different conclusions from it. So I'm going to show you one example here of what the system was used for. And this comes to us from the Korean Institute of Material Science. Okay. So the challenge here was looking at the 3D morphology of Gauss grains in electrical steel. And viewing these morphologies is um, a little bit challenging, somewhat can be limited with other techniques like EBSC or even XRD. Using EBSC with FIB, the range of observation is a little small in terms of the voxel dimension. Even though you get wonderful resolution, the volume image is really small. And you're looking at abnormally growing grains here. Uh, penetration of depth of metal so can be limited in XRD or synchrotron techniques. So here the authors decided that using an optical imaging technique with mechanical serial sectioning with a RoboMet 3D provided unique results of the 3D data with these abnormally growing grains in a iron silicon containing steel. And you can see that they imaged these abnormally growing grains. It, published, it was published in materials characterization last year. They were able to uh, compile these really detailed 3D models of the surface morphology as well as the 3D morphology of these grains. And so I would recommend that to you as a really good study to look at. I told you that we talked briefly about the global install base, and I mentioned in the previous slide that came from the Korean Institute of Material Science. So we're glad to tell you that these systems are in about 25, 30 different locations around the world, starting with industry, places like GE Aviation or IHI Incorporated in Japan. Uh, many academic institutions, such as the Colorado School of Mines or the University of Birmingham in the UK, and of course, many, many government laboratories. The AFRL and the Naval Research Lab in DC, of course, NASA Glenn and Oak Ridge National Laboratories. So we have a few of these systems out there that can generate these exciting, unique optical insights uh, with the capability that the system gives you. That brings me to the end of the overview of the system that we have and how it operates with that one brief example that I gave. So to bring up somebody that has examples or workflows of interest to this community, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Chapman, and he's going to be talking to us about applying these serial section of microscopy to additively manufactured metallic samples. Mike? Yes. Thank you, Sunar. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a UES employee, but I, I work, or I, I sit over at AFRL. Uh, and, and most of my work is on a RoboMet system that we've integrated in with an SEM. So today I'm going to be talking about one of our cases. It was, a, it was an additively manufactured TIE 6 four cylinder. Uh, so a, a lot of what we get in our lab now is actually additive samples. Uh, and, and just like just like this one, uh, CT was performed on it, and it ended up not being quite quite enough to, to answer all the questions that were uh, that were asked really. Um, so just a little bit about the sample. So the, the build plate is there on the left. Uh, there's a bunch of a whole bunch of different shapes on there, but um, of interest in this case study are two cylinders. So there's a kind of a block of 12 different cylinders that are all all equivalent on the on the middle left of the build plate, and then one identical cylinder on the bottom left of the build plate. And the sorry, in the far left image, the actual image of the plate. Um, and then so the the right image uh, kind of has the rainbow spectrum going across it. Uh, is how the layers were actually processed, or at least for this one specific layer, uh, where the, I believe, blue is the start of the, of the uh, beam path and red is the end. Uh, so the, the main part of this that this uh, picture is trying to show is that uh, this was processed on Mio's machine, uh, so the, uh, the stripes were rotated every 67 degrees per, per layer. So on this one layer, uh, everything was process normally, except for the very bottom right corner, you can see is red where it should be blue if it was, if it was just a standard build plate. So that far, that, that cylinder that's isolated in the corner was always processed at the end of the, 
uh, at the end of the layer. Uh, so, uh, and, that, and that happened for every layer going up. So, uh, if you go to the next slide, the interesting part when comparing one one of the cylinders from the block of 12 uh, from the middle of the plate compared to the, the one in the, the the corner of the plate that was processed in isolation is that the, the porosity volume fraction was about 16 times uh, in the corner of the build plate processed by itself. Uh, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the initial intent of the test, but um, the fact that there was the CT was showing 16 times the porosity was very very troublesome or very worrisome at least. Uh, so one thing to note on the, the the one that was processed with the rest of the build, the large purple pour, that was an intentional inclusion. That was a another part of another test. Uh, so you can not not count that uh, that large pour there. Uh, but even just qualitatively from the the CT, it's it's, it's a lot more porosity for for some reason. So the the researchers came to us wanting one know what kind of defects they were. Was this inner uh, was this at the stripe boundaries? Was this inner hatch? Um, what was the, the actual mechanism for uh, causing this porosity? And then uh, if you go to the next slide. Another thing that was showing up in the CT were these uh, just high density inclusions. So they also wanted to know just what was the actual cause of that? Is that contamination in the powder or something coming off in the outerization process or part of the, the rake or, or where was this contamination coming from? So if we knew that the actual chemical analysis, we could help to back that out. And another thing to notice in the CT is that uh, if you can see the stripe boundaries coming out, at least on some layers, very well. Um, but there's also just a whole lot of uh, just noise in the background. And they were curious as to whether that was real porosity or if it was just noise and, and artifacts from the CT process. So the, the CT scan for this was about a 25 micron voxel size. Uh, so uh, it seems to be about par for uh, this, this size build. We've gotten a little criticism that this could have been pushed a little bit further on this system. But uh, if anything, we see larger builds coming out of CT with, uh, with even larger voxel sizes. So uh, those are the main three things they were wanting to understand. So this is just a side-by-side -side of uh, equivalent slices, uh, CT on the right and optical microscopy on the left. Uh, so one thing to note is that in the little subsection there on the optical microscopy is that some of the pores, uh, they were large enough that they actually had either loose powder particles or partially fused powder particles. Uh, inside of the pores, uh, which would also just uh, lower the intensity on the, the CT scans. Uh, also made it fun for us to polish because that would, uh, as you'll see eventually, it'll, it'll be falling out. Uh, but another just trip, uh, attribute to how large these, these pores really were. The next slide. And the video. So this is a, a fly through of the serial sectioning data. And as you can see, as the uh, stripe boundaries pop in and out. And you really start to see the, uh, the inner hatch, or at least the yeah, inner hatch and possibly inner layer defects uh, showing up. So a lot of that noise that was in the CT scan um, ended up actually being real porosity. Uh, so for this optical run, there's uh, the resolution is about two microns, which is not really pushing these optical scopes at all. But since the pore sizes in this were so large, this was completely adequate. Um, the out of plane resolution, we started at about one micron slice thickness, uh, and then because we wanted to get to the high, metal, or high density inclusion, uh, we ramped that up to about five microns for, for part of the scan, uh, which if you want to play that video again. Um, in the middle, when all of a sudden there's a like, bright spot in the middle and, and things kind of go haywire, that was with the, the five micron slice thicknesses. So I'll, I'll go into that a bit more, into a bit more detail in a, in a few slides. So this is just a six by six montage of images, just 36 images per slice. Um, stitched together, that's about a 5K by 5K pixel uh, image. Uh, we, we did 260 slices for uh, about 425 microns of removal. So this is a, a 3D reconstruction uh, just done in Dream 3D, uh, the porosity structure. Uh, you can see that we went through, the goal was to go through at least one uh, layer thickness. So we have two stripe boundaries here, so we, we at least covered that. Um, just to understand the, the actual porosity structure through one of the stripe boundaries. Uh, next slide. So when we change from the one micron slice thickness to five micron, now we, are, we constantly also went from a one micron polishing slurry to about a six micron polishing slurry. Um, and when, when we did that, it started to, instead of polishing the, the partially fused powder particles, we believe it started uh, just tearing them out of the, the bottoms of the pores, which created these starburst patterns. Uh, so just a, somewhat of an anomaly to, to look out for if you are doing mechanical polishing. You, you can't introduce mechanical-based polishing artifacts. So in, in this case, when we when those 
artifacts showed up, you, you want to make sure you're not overestimating the amount of porosity because uh, it's very easy to segment out the, the starburst as pores. So that you can see in the, the right plot, or the, the plot on the right side, is uh, when you can tell when the, the polishing rate was increased. Uh, so in that, the red box range is when those starburst patterns appeared and, and when we uh, were hesitant to, to make uh, assumptions about the, the volume fraction. So uh, here the, the left plot is the porosity area fractions per slice um, as we went through the, the pseudo-sectioning experiment. Uh, and then on the right is the material removal plot. So the, the equivalent areas are, are boxed in red. So that's, that's where we, we have less confidence in the, uh, in the, the porosity of volume fraction. So the CT experiment was showing about uh, 0.5 uh, volume percent for porosity. And uh, with all the inner hatch defects along with the, uh, the better segmentation of the stripe boundary defects, uh, it was upwards to 2.5% uh, porosity volume fraction. Uh, depending on where at, where, you, where you are actually hitting the stripe boundaries, so this this is a lot more a lot more uh, porosity than the CT was initially estimating. So as I mentioned before, we, we ramped up to the, the five micron slice thickness to try to get to this high density inclusion. Uh, we decently knew where we were in the zero section experiment compared to CT because of all the stripe boundaries, those nice inter er, interior markers. So uh, we slowed back down, as you can see, the polishing rate got back down to about one micron as we got close to the, the inclusion. Um, and then so in the top left, that's the CT scan where you can see the, the bright spot. And on the right is the optical. When we were somewhat expecting to see kind of a, a dense particle, since that's how it looked in the CT. Uh, but in optical, it didn't really show anything. So as I mentioned before, the AFRL system is a, it's a RoboMet 3D combined with a six-axis automation robot and also a, a test scan SEM, which we have fully automated. Um, we can do 3D EBSD or 3D EDS runs along with just backscatter imaging um, if, that's, if that's desired to actually do 3D experiments that way. Um, but this also gives us a tool that we can just implant a sample that we like this. We just have a, a one-off case basis to, to do some additional analysis. So. Here's the, the backscatter images on the left and the, the secondary image on the right, uh, which in the backscatter image, I believe, I say it's showing up a little bit dark on our screen. Um, but if we go to the next slide, this is just a zoom in of the, the, the high density inclusion region. And the backscatter image, you can kind of see a, a bright swirl. Uh, and this is right at the, the exact location of the, the high density inclusion. So we went ahead and did EDS. Uh, so this is the, it's the strontium map and a tungsten map uh, for that same region, uh, both of which are, are showing a bit of intensity on there. Uh, which we go to the next slide. The, the X-ray, the spectrum map, the peaks line up pretty well for, for tungsten and strontium. So, and tungsten makes a lot more sense for what would be in there since the uh, atomization tips for making the powder are made out of tungsten carbide. So we assume that a piece of that flaked off somewhere in the atomization process. So it's good. This, this information can get passed back to the researchers to see if that's going to be a, an issue having that in the microstructure compared to other elements. So yeah, just in summary, uh, CT definitely has its limitations uh, just because of resolution and uh, tomography effects. Um, serial section is really limited just on uh, if you can see, or depending on the, what imaging modality you want to use. So we, we have no limitations on resolution. It's just going to take a lot longer to collect more images. Uh, where, yeah, we are limited, limited on the, the beam from, from X-ray. Um, so yeah, we, we get a lot of samples going through our lab, just uh, either calibrating um, X-ray CT experiments, um, or if people are just wanting standalone high resolution data sets, understanding the, the porosity structures, or um, in our system, we, we also get microstructure. Uh, requirements where people are wanting to understand the grain structure. Uh, so Roma 3 here has been shown to, to work for anomaly interrogation. Uh, if you know where, where the anomaly is and uh, how far you need to go, uh, we can track it and then, and then get down to that, that anomaly. So with that, I'll pass it on to Bill Davis. Good afternoon. This is Bill Davis. Uh, we'll go through the actual ceramic matrix composite. In this uh, image here, you're going to see a ceramic matrix composite and some of the issues that we're actually looking for and some of the characteristics 
Uh, we use this a lot to characterize composites for aviation in the aerospace industry, especially since it's being used more and more in the aviation aerospace in industry. Uh, we're focusing at the fiber orientation as well as the fiber sizes, as well as the matrix. And the things that we're looking for in here is the CMC is actually being used in aviation now, especially in the GE Leap as well as the GE Gen X. Consistency is what we're looking for, and the big challenge here was to understand the matrix composite as well as the fibers and how the fiber sizes as well as how the fibers are actually woven, as well as the uh, penetration of the silicon matrix into the fibers itself. So in the inside in the example here is they use a PF hip infusion of silicon-silicon composite. Uh, the things we are looking for are some of the unreacted materials within the different, go back, different um, in the matrix itself. We're also interested in porosity where you get a lack of fusion from the matrix as well as looking at the fiber, fiber sizes, um, as well as the weave pattern of the fibers is showing the different type of um, colors in the next photo that you'll see. The process we went through was uh, use a three micron diamond uh, with a DAC cloth, and you can see the polishing steps with the colloidal silica, as well as a cleaning process to rinse and clean and air dry it to minimize the damage, metallurgical damage, as well as you can make sure we had a nice clean surface for imaging. From the RoboMap perspective, we did about 50 slices. Magnification, we used a 20x objective to get 200x magnification. Uh, resolution, we're looking at 0.53 microns per pixel, and the thickness was about 3.8 microns per slice, and that was based on the focal plane of the microscope and how it actually focused in on those features. So the total area we actually looked at was about 189 microns. And the actual volume analyzed is about 1,500 by 1,500 by 190 microns. On the image on the left, you're going to see what we can do was the 2D image, uh, looking at the fibers, fiber orientation, uh, the 90 versus the uh, zero degree orientation. And on the right side, you're going to see the color coordination showing some of the actual features we were focused on. Some of the features is uh, the, the actual pores, uh, some of the unmelted, uh, unsolidified areas, as well as the fibers and fiber orientations themselves. 2D processing, we use a Fuji to illustrate the, and to actually do some correction of the imaging. And some of the images that we actually analyzed actually he did have some water stains and some scratches on them. So to remove those, uh, artifacts, we use Fuji in the 2D processing as well as alignment to make sure that our alignment was correct when we did the actual stitching. From the 3D, we used Image Pro. Image Pro, we used it as a segmentation to image features, especially when it came to extracting specific uh, features within the actual composite material. And some of those features that were actually analyzed uh, or were actually analyzed looking at the actual dimensions, the extraction, the actual um, morphology of the actual matrix, as well as the uh, volume percent of the actual fibers versus the matrix, as well as the aspect ratio of the uh, porosity and the unmelted areas and how that affected the actual uh, ceramic composite itself. Here's a 3D stack image of the actual uh, 50 slices. And if you look at the lower uh, bottom of the actual image, you'll see how you can see uh, the fibers, the fiber orientations, and how they flow down into it. But you can also see the unmelted areas as well as the volume percent of the actual uh, voids and also how the void percentages. Go ahead and next one. In this area here, we focus mainly on looking at the volume percent of voids without actually 
at each layer and actually the overall three-dimensional uh, three area. And then on the right, we're seeing the volume percent of the actual um, fibers themselves versus the matrix itself. So we were able to look to determine the volume percent of voids versus the volume percent of fiber, as well as the volume percent of the matrix and how the matrix actually penetrated into the actual fibers themselves. This is giving you a segmentation of the actual matrix and how the matrix flowed through the actual fibers and around the fibers, as well as the unreacted areas, which was a bigger concern, is those unreacted areas were areas of major concern because that is going to be more susceptible to uh, lack of uh, fusion as well as bonding, and it's going to be a weaker point within the ceramics. So here is one of the things that we did discover while we were actually doing the serial sectioning is in the upper right-hand corner we found a small crack, and this small crack uh, was due for lack of fusion, and that small crack actually showed us that it was a lot bigger than they really thought it was, and it was something that was not really detected, nor it was something that they expected to find within the actual ceramic material. So this was actually a big surprise for them to find out that, hey, we had a crack in here that initiated but it also showed them how it propagated within the matrix and how it stopped its fibers. And that was a, a nice surprise for them to understand a little bit more about the composite matrix uh, and how it uh, performed when you had a crack within it. At that point, I'll hand it over to Dr. Cesar. Thank you, Bill. So, summarize what you've seen so far. You know, we explained a little bit about the serial sectioning method and how we literally we're deconstructing materials for microstructure, for morphology, for features, and defects using automated metallography. Dr. Chapman's example showed us how on a larger scale of material, you know, cubic millimeters to about cubic centimeters in some cases, with very high resolutions of microns plus, we're able to look at these samples in some detail and understand exactly what our processes give us. Now, Bill's example showed us that we're not limited by sample density or radio opacity, even in something challenging like a 6 sig composite, which can be difficult to analyze using X-ray techniques, or the sample that Mike showed us. We are able to get very meaningful and actionable insights on how these materials behave and what drives their behavior and failure mechanisms. And finally, because it's a metallography-based technique, this can tell you microstructure as well as grain features not seen by other techniques, either by using some kind of etching, if your sample is amenable to that, or as Mike pointed out, with EBSD or mobile electron microscope-based techniques. So hopefully that's given you a good flavor of how the system works, as well as a couple of examples of what can be done with the system in additive manufacturing and in allied areas. So we have some good news or special news for this particular audience. Um, we, as UES, recently joined America Makes, and we're very happy to be members because it enables us to have good technical in-depth conversations like this with many of our members. So we've made available an America Makes member discount, and members are eligible for an exclusive discount on RoboMet Materials Analysis Services. You can take advantage of this offer by going to the link on your screen, and we'll send that out in a follow-up message too and filling out the contact form, which will enable you to uh, discuss your case with us, understand better what you're trying to get after, and we will help you custom design an investigation that tells you at hopefully a price that's very attractive to you. In our next slide, we're going to see basically just some contact information. Um, so, you know, just our site, uescom slash RoboMed3D is a place where you can go to see some contact and in, uh, additional information about this. You're welcome to reach out to us at marketing at UES.com. And we have some upcoming events. Uh, we will be at the TMS, um, boot number 211. Please contact us to schedule a one-to-one -one consultation. And then again, of course, at TRX, we will have members there, so we'd be very happy to see our fellow America Makes members there, too. Scott, at this point, I'd like to pause a little bit because I think I see a question from Mr. Ajay Krishnan. Um, how long would it take to polish an image about 10 layers of an Inconel alloy? You're trying to understand the time frames involved for this process. I'll tell you that in our experience, that's a fairly quick process uh, with a couple of caveats. 
I would like to understand better what sort of an area you're imaging on, uh, the surface that is exposed. And since this is a metallography grinding-based system, a critical question that we'd want to understand is like, you know, how long does, how long, how far apart are each of these layers spaced? So it's fairly quick to go through, let's say, a five micron layer compared to, let's say, a 60 or a 70 micron layer. But typically, something like that can be finished within uh, several hours to just collect the data and analyze it. Mike, what would you add from your experience in terms of looking at about 10 layers of an in-canal alloy? I say for me, I would say it really matters on your cross-sectional area. Uh, uh, some samples we have are just like a 500 micron cross-section, which, as Mike Sooner said, is, is very fast. Uh, but we also have had some that are an inch thick, so and that's going to take longer. Oh, a lot longer, yeah. right? So each layer typically doesn't take that long, but when you start stacking those up in numbers, we can add up some of the time tolls that it takes in the system. Even though it's automated, even though it's highly repeatable, our investigations typically scale with the volume of materials analyzed. Bill, would you add a little bit of your perspective in terms of like what's the largest volume maybe you've gone through? Largest volume I've actually looked at, we looked at uh, CMCs as well as 718, looking for inclusions and porosity, is we've looked at an image that was uh, one inch by one and a half inch, and we removed uh, 100 mils. So, it, but there we were actually removing 40 to 50 mils per step. Right. So that was a bigger jump to try to remove a lot of material to two, but with the features we were actually looking for were a lot larger. So you can go down to microns as well as mils in your process. Thanks for those perspectives, we appreciate it. Ajay, I hope we answered your question in terms of the time frame that's involved. And like I said, it's a really good question. Um, we look for any other questions or comments from the audience. Yeah, that looked like the only question that I saw come through, Sundar. Um, if, there, if anyone does have anything, obviously there were some. There's some contact information on the screen at the moment. If, <clears throat> if there's a question that arises <clears throat> after you, uh, you know, after the webinar closes, as well as um, you know, secondarily, this material that we that we went over today is, has been recorded and will be made available to America Makes and anyone that is interested. So if you take this back to your teams or to your organizations and want to explore this further, you have access to this recorded webinar that you can, uh, that you can you know, give others this experience as well. And, and again, as Sundar mentioned, that and, and the rest of the team is available to answer any of those questions. You can just reach out to them. Um, is there anything that we needed to cover that we didn't? I know we had sort of it felt like we kind of covered a lot of the questions that that the American Makes team had presented to you uh, regarding, um, you know, what kind of materials can be analyzed and, and things of that sort. Is there anything that you would like to continue to go over? That's about it. I think we, we've concluded our part of it. So if there are any questions again or any further thoughts, we'd welcome your insights at marketing at UES.com or contact us through our website, please. Okay, that's terrific. And just a reminder, anybody that is um, that is on the on the webinar today that's interested, March 20 and 21 this this year in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Southwest Research Institute is hosting America Makes for for our spring TRX. If you haven't been to a TRX, it's um, it's a technical review and exchange where we present projects that are funded through the America Makes program or other efforts taking place by our members, you know, whether it's an America Makes funded project or effort or not. Um, and we have a technical exchange at these events. And what, what it is, it's, a, it's an opportunity for those technical folks in our membership and even non-members to come together and uh, to experience the kind of, the kind of uh, programs and projects that America Makes uh, works on and to challenge and learn and understand um, from your peers in this in this technology space. So check it out. It's on the America Makes website under TRX SWRI. There's a additional TRX event scheduled for the summer. I don't have dates on that at the moment. Um, but please check it out. Stay in touch with America Makes and um, attend one of our events. Uh, so that kind of wraps it up today for this webinar series. 
I want to thank Christy and Bill and Mike and Sundar for their uh, wonderful information and UES for participating. If you or your organization is interested in sharing on the TRX webinar series, please fill out the form that follows the presentation and uh, contact Tiffany West Bay at America Makes and she can get you the information that's necessary and how to, how to participate as a, uh, as a presenter. I want to thank everybody and if no one has any additional questions or uh, any of our friends from UES don't have anything additional to add, we'll just close it here. I want to thank everybody for joining and uh, have a super day. Stay warm out there, folks. Thank you all, folks. Thank you. Much appreciated.